We're going to go ahead and begin now. Is everybody ready? <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending this press conference, which is presented to you in the public on behalf of the parents of Terrence Franklin, who was known to them as Mookie. He lost his life at the hands of the Minneapolis Police Department officers on, on May 10th, as I'm sure all of you know. As counsel for Mookie's parents, we felt it was important to comment on some concerns we have with the conduct of the Minneapolis Police Department. In addition, we will, we will present audio evidence about Mookie's death from near the homicide scene and explain the relevance of that, although I think that will be self-evident. Self I want to introduce the folks who are up here with me. First of all, my name is Mike Padden, and my email address is mike.padden, P-A-D-D-E-N, at paddenlaw.com. I am a partner with the law firm of Padden and McAllister, PLLC. And for media, all you need to do is simply email me, and I will hit you back with all of my contact information if any of you need to get, get a hold of me. Uh, seated to my left is Walter Franklin. Uh, Mookie's father, and seated to my right, right is Sheila O'Neill, Mookie's mother. I want to make clear that my firm has an attorney-client relationship with Mr. Franklin and Ms. O'Neill at this point in time. However, under Minnesota wrongful death law, there are other heirs. For example, brothers and sisters can be heirs, and we do expect that these individuals will all be part of this case in the event that there is a lawsuit. There is also the possibility that other firms will be involved as co-counsel with us, but currently it's just my firm who represents Ms. O'Neill and Mr. Franklin. Uh, also to my right is Carlova Powell, who is an associate lawyer with my firm, along with a young man named Lakavik Chambers, who is a, a current cli client of my firm and was a good friend of Mookie. I will explain in a little while why Lakavik is here. All of us will be willing to answer questions once our presentation is over except Mr. Chambers, although I can make him available at a later date in the event that there is a need for that. Uh, when you ask questions, I'd appreciate if you please identify your news organization in advance of asking your question. And I would appreciate it that only members of the media ask questions. I think there are other folks here. This is open to the public, and we would prefer that any questions come from credentialed media. We will provide you, if you would like, a script of our presentation, but that would be via email, not today. So if you would like a script of this presentation, uh, simply request that via email, please. I expect the presentation to last about 35 minutes. I'd also like to thank the Minneapolis Urban League for allowing us to use their facility. I also want to make clear that we are reaching out to the public for anyone who has information relevant to the facts of this matter. And in that event, please simply email and I will get back to you. I want to make clear, ladies and gentlemen, that, that there is no lawsuit at this time and no decision has been made at this time as to whether suit will, will be commenced. There may not be a lawsuit. There might be a lawsuit. We just don't know at this point. What we lawyers have been asked to do to the best of our ability is to find out the truth about what happened on May 10 from beginning to end, and most importantly, how it is and why Mookie is dead. Sometimes, of course, civil litigation can be helpful to get to the truth. There are discovery procedures such as depositions, the ability to subpoena witnesses, and a free exchange of information between the, the litigants in a lawsuit. Today would have been Mookie's 23rd birthday. He was born on May 30, 1990, and the fact that this press conference is happening on the, on the day of his birth is a coincidence. We did not plan it that way, but I want to make clear to you that he would have been 23 today. Um, obviously, under this circumstance, we have a situation where a person of color uh, passes away under what I would contend are strange circumstances in the presence of Minneapolis De Police Department officers. I think you folks know that there was a story that has appeared in local media based on unnamed sources as to what happened in the moments before Mookie died. It is clear these sources are with the Minneapolis Police Department, and this is something that is disturbing to my clients, namely, sources not willing to go on the record. 
This was about seven days after Mookie passed away, and it was before his funeral that that information came out. It appears, and the scenario goes something like this. Mookie was in a house. There was a police dog, and multiple officers were present, all who were armed. This included SWAT team members. It appears that two officers were injured by gunfire, and Mookie was shot many times and killed. I don't believe that's in dispute. It is apparently the contention of the sources that Mookie, and only Mookie, the dead guy, is responsible for all of this carnage. The main contention, it appears, is that he apparently grabbed an officer's gun, shot off rounds, and successfully hit two officers before he was killed by another officer. I want to make clear to you that it's the position of Mookie's parents, other family, and friends that this young man was not capable of that type of conduct, it and it would be completely out of character for him. Frankly, when you look at the scenario that the unnamed sources are opining, uh, it's really suicide. And I want to let you know that there will be no evidence at any time that Mookie was ever suicidal at any time in his life. In fact, the information I've received is that he was a happy-go-lucky young man, loved life, not suicidal. Obviously, when you grab a police gun in the pres presence of other police officers, you're asking to be killed instantly. Suffice to say, in the event that that is the final scenario that's presented by the Minneapolis Police Department, uh, this family is not going to accept that type of conclusion. We obviously will look at the evidence closely once Chief Harto uh, renders a dis uh, information to the public as to the department's uh, position as to what happened. We presume that that will come from Chief Harto. Uh, and I, I will tell you that certainly once an opinion is opined or a position is opined by the Minneapolis Police Department, we are obviously going to want to see physical evidence to support any verbal conclusions. Uh, we also want, at the time that information is released, recorded statements of the involved officers. Not just summaries, recorded statements. As you can imagine, when, when a young man's life is taken like this, the family is absolutely devastated with, with the loss of their son. Um, there's something else that has them very concerned from that day. You folks are probably aware that there is a video that has been on YouTube taken from across the street where Mookie was killed. At second 24 and 26, respectively, there are words that can, we, we can hear that we are, are, presume are from the voice of two separate MPD officers. In a moment, we're going to play that for you, but I want you to understand something right now. I have not listened to the actual audio and, and seen the actual video that was taken, apparently, by a neighbor from across the street. Ironically, the individual that took that video has just, just today reached out to me, and I believe that we'll make that available uh, for us. Nonetheless, we do feel confident that the audio that could be heard on the internet and on YouTube is an accurate rendition of what, uh, what was spoken by Minneapolis officers. We're going to play that audio now. Will that be video too, Kurt? We'll turn the lights off, folks. I can get that to you. Yeah, it's no problem. I want you to play it one more time, please, Kirk. Folks, this is a short version. That's good. Let's get the lights back on.
it is certainly reasonable to conclude that the voices that can be heard on this audio are Minneapolis police officers. It's our position that there are two significant lines that can be heard. The first one is, quote, watch out for the nigger, close quote. And the second one is, damn freaking nigger. Now, I want you folks to understand that if something develops where this contention is false or inaccurate, I will, I will publicly apologize for that. But I can tell you that we feel very confident that those are the words that are spoken. And if this is true, this is chilling. This is 2013, and employees of the Minneapolis Police Department are using racial slurs in the field. No police officer anywhere in the United States should be using racial, racial slurs. I'm assuming that this is a violation of department policy. And certainly, it is expected that officers will use profanity in the field. I don't think I get that. That's fine. Really hardcore profanity. Nobody would expect them not to. Sometimes you need to use that kind of language to get people to respond to you. But I think you can see that this is the type of thing that's, that supports the belief of some people that racism is a problem that is endemic in the Minneapolis Police Department. Let me give you another example. You know, I don't like people that make gratuitous assertions without providing support. I've been practicing law for 26 years. I lived in Minneapolis for 15 years, so I've been around a little bit. You know, I've been litigating cases for 26 years. I want to give you information about a case I had not long ago which supports my contention that there are problems at times with the way the department deals with citizens in the field. The law is clear that a police officer has to have probable cause before pulling over a citizen in a motor vehicle. On August 14, 2009, an African-American man named Iris Stafford was pulled over on a Minneapolis street by a Minneapolis police officer. By the way, this was just after all the publicity about the corruption of the Metro Gang Strike Force. I'm going to first show you raw video footage, squad video footage, which we will have uh, played now for you. Get the lights, please. Lights back on, please. Now, folks, you probably think that this man had just committed a serious felony, such as robbing a bank or committed a multiple murder or perhaps some serious assault. His sin was he was driving the Minneapolis streets without a non-operating brake light. It was a mechanical problem. Allegedly, that was the reason that was articulated in a police report as to why this man was pulled over. Let me show you something else. Buddha. Come back, buddy. It is August 2009, 4.30 in the morning, when an officer pulls Ira Stafford over. I pulled over like I was supposed to. The officer came up to the truck and asked me to step out of the truck. As I opened the door, he grabbed my, my wrist 
What happens next is rather hard to watch. Stafford says he thinks an officer used a taser on him, although he says he wasn't resisting. I've never been tased before, so I'm not really sure what it what it is. I know it, whatever it was, it was a joke, you know, and it was uncomfortable. The Fox 9 investigators reviewed police reports, and the officers didn't mention use of a taser. And there's more. This situation is an absolute outrage. Stafford's attorney is not talking about the arrest. He wants us to rewind to look at the actual stop from the beginning. With the country music song, every light in the house is on, blaring in his squad car, the officer pulls Stafford over for a non-working right rear brake light. Non-working, really? The right rear is lit. He lets off the brake, they both go quiet. It's a brake, they light again. Longtime professional mechanic and business owner Jim Cook says he's played the video frame by frame and is sure both brake lights were working. They work, absolutely. Not only when the officer stopped Stafford, but when the car was later loaded onto a flatbed tow truck. See how both come on? It's clear from the evidence in this case, the officer had absolutely no probable cause whatsoever <clears throat> to pull this man over, at least the probable cause that he indicates in his report. Because, of course, if the stop hadn't happened... You don't really have to do anything. Police pretty much do what they want to do. The rest of it wouldn't have either. Stafford hasn't filed a lawsuit against police, but might. After the stop, he was charged with obstructing the legal process, but the city attorney dropped those charges after watching the same tape you saw. I'm Trish Van Pilsom for the Fox 9 Investigators. I think it's important to note, ladies and gentlemen, that you have a person of color and its conduct, I think, that can only be described as shocking. Isn't it clear that the officer flat out lied about probable cause? I don't see how you could sugarcoat that other than to say it just was a, a dishonest statement. Uh, it should be noted that the prosecutor with the city attorney's office, a lawyer with an impeccable reputation, immediately dropped the disorderly conduct charge upon viewing this video. Mr. Stafford was incarcerated for three days and was never able to get his car back because he couldn't afford the impound fees. I would, first of all, I'd like to uh, give credit to Trish Van Pilsen for that story with Fox 9 News. It was a, obviously a really well done story, which I think, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. That's certainly a good example of that. I would note, as, as an aside, the gentleman that was presented as an expert on that video, Jim Cook, is the same man who, at the time of the vehicle inspection of Kua Fong Lee in the Toyota matter, folks probably recall that from 2006, uh, was involved with the inspection of the vehicle which the, the judge ordered, which was relevant to the judge's decision on granting Mr. Lee a new trial. And he determined, uh, Mr. Cook that is, that the left rear brake lamp of the Toyota was energized at the time of impact and the other experts that were, were there including Toyota's, Toyota's expert agreed with that. There's no question in my mind that Mr. Cook's hard work was significant and the fact that Kua Fong Lee was never recharged. I want to talk to you about another situation and this is a, a more recent example in case you think these are old examples and perhaps they're not relevant to, to today. Uh, follow me on this. The setup is fairly lengthy. On March 9, 2012, in broad daylight in the North Minneapolis neighborhood, two young men walked up to a Dodge Stratus occupied by five young males and started shooting. Crime does not get more brazen than this, and obviously law enforcement and the prosecuting authorities had tremendous motivation to solve this crime and make sure that the two individuals responsible were removed from the streets forever. 
It was estimated that, that over 30 rounds were fired, including rounds that penetrated nearby homes. There were two individuals in the Stratus who were hit by rounds, and they were interviewed by the Minneapolis Police Department at a local hospital, but at, at that time they provided little information of value in terms of solving the crime. Days later, one of the victims identified Lakavic Chambers, seated two to my left here, who was African American as one of the shooters. Uh, this identification was flawed for many reasons, which I will not detail at this time, but nonetheless, Lakavic was criminally charged and arrested in April of last year. He could not afford bond due to the high bail and therefore remained incarcerated. I was retained to defend him. I was his attorney. If he was convicted on all these charges, he was looking at a sentence of 40 years. As the case progressed, it was clear that the case was flawed for many reasons, including the fact that there was no evidence of any relationship whatsoever with Lakavic and the other shooter for whom there was a great deal of evidence. Shooter one, I'll call him. There was huge amount of evidence that this individual was involved in the crime. Normally when two people conspire to commit multiple murder, they are at least acquainted. At least acquainted. That was not the case here. Our investigation revealed the identity of the other perpetrator, which is known in the law as an alternative perpetrator defense. In other words, everybody, and it was well known in the community who this individual was, so it wasn't a lot of hard work on my part to figure out who that was. Um, everybody seemed to know who, who the second shooter was except the Minneapolis Police Department, the prosecutor who was Nancy McLean with the Hennepin County Attorney's Office. In June, evidence, this is June of 2012, evidence came to light that the victim who identified Lakavic told a friend on Facebook that Lakavic did not commit the crime. So the only reason that Lakavic was charged was because of this one identification by the one, the one victim. There was no other evidence whatsoever to implicate Lakavic with this horrible crime. That same month, in June of 2012, with the permission of Ms. McLean, I presented this and other evidence to the lead investigator with the Minneapolis Police Department, a man named Sergeant Kendall Chambers. My main motivation was to get him out of jail because I didn't think I was doing my job if he had to stay in jail for seven months for a crime he didn't do. Uh, so that was my thinking, uh, especially since it was clear he was innocent. Sergeant Chambers looked me in the eye and said he would take the matter seriously and follow the leads and that he did not want to see an innocent man convicted, let alone charged. As time went on, I would per periodically check with Ms. McLean as to the status since we had a November <coughs> trial date. On August 14, 2012, something critical happened, which, which I was not told about until nine weeks later. The victim called Sergeant Chambers, remember he's a lead investigator, and told him that he had to make a correction because he had seen the actual perpetrator in a gas station. And it was at that moment he realized he had originally fingered the wrong guy. I called this a flashback or an epiphany when I argued the case to a Hennepin County jury. This was the same guy who everyone in North Minneapolis knew had committed the crime and who I suggested as a suspect in June. On October 23, 2012, I was finally provided with a copy of this statement. So I didn't know about, his, about its existence, existence at all for nine weeks. And this was only about two weeks from the trial date. As you can imagine, I was livid. It was also clear that the Minneapolis Police Department had done next to nothing about the leads they had been presented with in June. I was told by Ms. McLean that her late dis disclosure was, quote, an oversight, close quote. I brought a motion to dismiss, and Ms. McLean said she was going to meet with the victim that very day. So when I argued the motion before a Hennepin County judge, she, as part of her opposition, said, well, I'm meeting with him today. And I was happy about that because I just assumed that everything would be confirmed and then my guy would soon be out of jail. It was clear that the victim's correction was valid, but nonetheless, she got back to me the next day and said the guy had changed his mind again. It was clear, however, that between August 14, 2012 and November 8, 2012, when he had met with Ms. McLean, he had not endeavored whatsoever to change his mind again. He changed his mind during the interview with the prosecutor. This absurd case, and it can only be described as absurd, went to trial on November 13, 2012 and lasted four days. The judge was Hennepin County Judge Robert Small. An all-white Hennepin County jury returned a not guilty verdict on all six felony counts after less than two hours of deliberation. 
Lakavik spent seven months in jail for a crime he had nothing to do with. I would note as an aside that the individual responsible for the crime, the second shooter, is currently incarcerated on a gun charge. Shooter's one, shooter one's case is set for trial this summer, so that's coming up. Uh, it's my contention that the Minneapolis Police Department, the Hennepin County Attorney's Office, County Attorney's Office took a case to trial against a man they had to know was innocent. And there was more. It was clear the second shooter had been shot during this fracas because one of the victims had fired back. I begged for a physical exam since my client had never been shot in his life. This never happened. Never happened at all. <coughs> for those of you who may think I'm not objectively describing this, I have available for you a copy of the actual trial transcript. And I can make available for you at a later date, and this is for the media, relevant investigation materials if you have any interest in checking to see if what I'm saying is the truth. This is the trial transcript right here. This is it right here. And I can assure you that everything I'm saying about this case is corroborated by this. And sadly, the public is not served. This flawed prosecution practically guarantees that the actual perpetrator will never be tried, let alone charged. So instead of serving a 40-year sentence, he will be out in probably two years for his, for his current gun charge. Um, I want to make clear that I've redacted all references to the alternative perpetrator in this transcript, and I've also redacted all references to Shooter 1. I don't think it's really relevant to, to the point I'm trying to make here. Folks, I want to be clear about something. I firmly believe that the vast majority of people who choose law enforcement as a career want to do the right thing and do, in fact, behave admir admirably in this chosen prevent, uh, profession. You, you need look no further than the Minnesota State Patrol, the St. Paul Police Department, and the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office to see three organizations, I believe, that almost always get it right. They're well run. But for many years, the trail of problems with the Minneapolis De Police Department has lengthened and makes one, one, I think, have to have serious concerns. And certainly this current situation with the death of this young man raises, I think, significant red flags. I want to tell you something else about the Chambers case. There was a young Minneapolis Police Department officer, I'm not going to say his name, but his hard, intelligent work clearly and concisely documented in his report greatly, greatly assisted me and my client in proving his innocence. So it wasn't all bad. My issue is with the lead investigator not doing his job. This young officer deserves to be uh, commended and, as far as I'm concerned, um, awarded in some fashion for the excellent work he did on the case. His thinking was the same as mine, and because of his hard work, it helped me to prove Lakavik's uh, innocence. Sadly, though, even though this witness was subpoenaed, the prosecutor did not call the witness at trial after saying she would, and Sergeant Chambers was not called either. I also have available for you, if you would like, a Minnesota judge, I'm not going to say who, asked me to, to document and summarize what happened in this matter for him. And I have that available if you'd like to see it, if anybody has an interest in that. I have redacted his name uh, from, uh, from that letter, but it's a good summary of, of what happened. Not a high-profile case. No stories about the not guilty result. Didn't end up in the paper. Not a big deal, right? But this is a prime example of why people like me who interact with the Minneapolis Police Department on a frequent basis are at times troubled. Not always, but these are troubling matters. You have a young man who had nothing to do with this crime, who went through a trial and was stuck in jail for seven months for something he didn't do, something they could have figured out back on day one. Day one. And believe me, when something like this happens, regardless of whether it ends up in the media, this trickles back to the African-American community, especially in North Minneapolis. Is there any wonder why many people in the African-American community have no trust whatsoever of the Minneapolis Police Department? Is there any wonder? I want to comment for a moment about the motorcycle accident that happened on the day that Mookie was killed. I, I think I am in a good position to comment on that because as a trial attorney who's tried over 120 cases to verdict and has, has handled car accident litigation, motor accident, mo motorcycle litigation my whole career, I would like to make some points about that. The Minneapolis Police Department has emphasized that the cycle hit the squad car. In other words, the cycle was the so-called striking vehicle after the department finally admitted five days post-accident that the squad went through a red light. Finally admitted that. And we hear 
that the young injured Hispanic girl received no first aid from the Minneapolis Police Department at the scene before paramedics arrived. Again, a troubling fact, and we're dealing with a person of color. Now, that's based on media reports, and interestingly, the witnesses were attorneys, so I, <laughs> I don't know if attorneys could be good witnesses, but I think they can. Uh, in a case like that, ladies and gentlemen, the key <coughs> factors in the analysis of negligence are, number one is who failed to yield the right of way. That's the most important factor, not who struck who. And the other significant factor is, was there an emergency? There have been published reports, and I have no reason to doubt their authenticity, that the Mookie situation, he had been deceased for over 30 minutes, and that crime scene was, there was no emergency. So those are the, the key issues, not which vehicle struck which vehicle. It would be nice if there would be a press conference that would address that. Just be open about that. Presumably, the MPD knows the answer to that question. They're going to know specifically when the crime scene was cleared, and they're going to know specifically the time of the accident, these types of details. And it was particularly disconcerting that the officer who went through the red, and look, I, be clear about this. It's obvious this wasn't intentional. It was an accident. But it was disconcerting for me to hear that as of five days post-accident, he had not given a recorded statement, or no recorded statement had been secured from him. And we have heard rumors that the officers involved in Mookie's death had not given statements at least as of 10 days post-death. Anybody who conducts investigations, for example, insurance adjusters, will tell you that if you don't take statements promptly of those involved, it greatly affects the integrity and objectivity of the investigation. And you can never get that genie back in the bottle. And you know who knows this best? Minneapolis Police Department. That's how they operate. On the date of Mookie's death, both Mr. Franklin and Ms. O'Neill, and a sister of Ms. O'Neill's daughter and a sister of Mookie, were taken to the police station willingly and all gave statements. And the, the sister, they were adamant that the sister give her statement outside of the presence of Mr. Franklin and Ms. O'Neill. And this was about five hours after the homicide. I'm not critical of that, but the point is, if the department has that mindset, why aren't they giving recorded statements? I think it's time, and I reach out to legislators. A state legislator needs to come forward and propose legislation that in the event a citizen is killed or seriously injured at the hands of law enforcement, not just the Minneapolis Police Department, Law enforcement officers should be required to answer questions in a detailed recorded statement within only a few hours of the event. Police officers are servants of the public, directly compensated by the public, and they should not have the same rights as regular citizens mm -hmm. when it comes to this issue of, of recorded statements. And remember in this case, the Minneapolis Police Department largely has complete control of the investigation. I know they don't have absolute control. For example, the, the autopsy, they have no control over that as an example. But they, have, they largely have control of the investigation. I want to make a couple closing comments, then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, I know reasonable minds can differ on this, but I want you folks to know that my clients are not critical of the fact that Chief Harto is holding off on giving an official MD, M, uh, MPD position for Mookie's death until further investigation is completed. They are not critical of that, neither am I. Um, you know, I don't know much about her, but she certainly has an impeccable background. It seems clear that Mayor Ryback put a great deal of thought in, into his decision when he, he appointed her. She seems like a person of integrity, and at the end of the day, we are cautiously optimistic she will do the right thing. And the right thing from our perspective is to just to give us the truth about what happened and let the chips fall where they may. This completes our presentation, and uh, we'll now open it up for questions if there are any. Thank you. How were you able to make out, the, I'm sorry, Curtis Gilbert from NPR. Um, how were you able to make out what was uh, said on that YouTube video? I listened to it a bunch of times, and I just could not. I wouldn't swear that I could say exactly what people said. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Did you hear the N-word at all? I, I don't know. I, I mean, personally, I couldn't be sure. I mean, I'm asking you how you can be sure. Because I use my ears. <laughs> I, I'm not being disrespectful. Um, I've had probably 10 people listen to the audio. 
And of the 10 people that we've had listen to it, we all are on the same page in terms of what can be heard. Um, I will say this, the version that we have, which we will make, will make available for the media, uh, is uh, enhanced in the sense that, that some background noise is taken out. So what we have is something that I think makes it more audible. And I can tell you, I have no problem hearing it, personally. And neither do the, the other individuals we've had listen to it. Um, so I feel so comfortable about it, I'm telling you today that that's what, what can be heard. Now, if I'm wrong, I, as I said earlier, I will publicly apologize. I don't think I'm wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. And uh, I think the enhanced version, in my mind, does make it uh, more audible than the original raw uh, tape. Um, this gentleman's reached out to me. I really appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we certainly presumably will get access to the original and we'll see what we can do with that, Under understanding that we're not going to do anything to, to destroy or damage the evidence. It's an important piece of evidence. What it means at the end of the day in terms of Mookie's death, I don't know. I, it seems to me it's significant. If officers are in the scene using racial slurs, that's pretty disconcerting, isn't it? Dave? Uh, David Hanner's Finder Press. Was Mr. Franklin with anyone at the time? At the time he was killed? Yeah. We don't believe so, no. Then why would the officers be warning other officers to watch out for anything? Well, let me, let me answer that question this way, and I'll tell you what I hear. Um, the audio that I hear that's relevant, and I think, if you, I, I welcome you to listen, folks. Listen to it. I think you'll agree with what I'm about to say. You can see an officer running around, and if you're looking at the images on the YouTube video, this would be on the west side. You see an officer running around the front of a squad, and he says, where's the, if he either says officer shot or officer down, something like that. You then hear the response, bad. And, and bad is in, in the sense of a question. Another officer is asking, you know, is it bad? But he says bad. And then the next thing you hear is, where was he shot, is the next thing that I hear. Um, so I think that what perhaps the mindset was, was this guy is telling the other officers, look, we know the suspect's a black guy, and one of our guys has been hit, so possibly you have a couple of officers who are upset about that and are venting about the suspect who they happen to know is African American. So as far as I'm concerned, it makes sense in that context. So it appears to have been words that were uttered after all the shooting happened, but nonetheless, I still believe that's chilling. I think it's important. So that's my answer to that question, Dave. Sir, are you in the green? Uh, Edgar Linares of WCCO Radio. Um, with everything you presented, uh, with these cases that you came forward, are you just are you what are you trying to say about the Minneapolis Police Department? Are you trying to say that there that there's racism, and I think you've said that that there's racism in the officers, that this was a racially motivated incident <clears throat> for the, the shooting that took yeah. place, that they saw a black man with a gun and they said we have to kill him. What, what are you trying to say, sir? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. It's a very good question. Was this incident racially motivated? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. All I'm doing at this press conference is, is pointing out to you the experiences I've had as a, as a lawyer that makes me think, and I'm not the only one who thinks this way, a lot of folks think this way, that this department has a problem with racism and it, and it, and it is endemic. What does that mean? Does that mean 80% of the officers are racist? I'm not saying that at all. It's just, it seems like there are situations where people of color are involved where there are things that develop which are disconcerting. I mean, how can, you know, we just have this one situation where this young man is killed, and granted, it's after the time that he apparently was killed, but two officers are uttering the, the N-word in, in public? That's pretty, that's pretty chilling as far as I'm concerned. I don't know if this incident is racially motivated. I don't even know if the killing of this young man was an intentional thing. I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I guess we'll find out. You know, these are the kinds of issues that came up in the Fong Lee case. You know, was it an intentional killing? These kinds of things. So, go ahead, sir. I, I have a statement here from um, Chief Harto that she sent to us today at WCCO Radio saying that I have maintained the integrity of the investigation by consistently declining to respond to speculation and anonymous, and anonymous sources. It is disappointing that Mr. Franklin's family refuses my offer to meet to give them an inside look at the investi investigative process and statute, <coughs> yet they are free to make public accusations against my officers 
and question leg the legitimacy of our investigative, investigative practices. If you have video of events from the scene, I request that you turn it over to me as it is evidence in an active investigation. Any reaction to that from the yeah, Franklin family? Well, I mean, where do I start? There's so many things that, I mean, it, it, I, could, I could answer for 30 minutes, but let me just say a couple of things. We have the absolute right, the absolute right as citizens of this country to present our thoughts on these matters. The chief can have a press conference anytime she wants, and that's fine. And if the chief calls a press conference, I guarantee you that the media will dutifully appear and see what she has to say. So we certainly have the right to give our opinions. I'd like to know what the, what the Minneapolis Police Department's position is on this audio. I'd like to know what their position is. I think it's reasonable to assume. I mean, this happened 20 days ago. Isn't it reasonable to assume that they've enhanced that audio? That perhaps they already know the answer to that question? It'd be nice. I mean, it would it'd be interesting to see what she says. I don't know. Or what, what somebody else in the department says about that. Um, I, yeah, go ahead, Walt. I want to state that to the chief that she never got with the Franklin family. So I like her to stop addressing that to the media because no one called Sheila, no one has called me. And it's a shame if she's called to be the chief to not contact us. Are you saying at this point you're willing to meet? With no, 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 no. We're willing to meet once the investigation is complete. That's what we're willing to do. Also, let me, let me answer that. Just give me a second, folks. We're willing to meet her once the investigation is complete, but I would like to know what the ground rules of the meeting are going to be. For example, will I be able to ask her questions in the meeting? I, I would need to find that out because as a lawyer, it really wouldn't be appropriate for me to ask her questions because the city has counsel. So we'd, we'd have to get the ground rules figured out, but I can tell you if they have, we have that meeting, I don't have a lot of questions I'd like to ask. So, but uh, once the investigation is complete, that's something we'll give serious consideration to, and I believe my clients would be, would be fine with meeting with her. We really don't see the purpose of meeting with her now, but as Mr. Franklin just explained, they're saying that they've reached out to the family, but Terrence has never been contacted and Sheila's never been contacted. So. No one? Uh, Jessica Miles with Channel 5. Yeah, sorry, Jessica. I was having a brain. I know you, Jessica. I just forgot your Jessica. name. Sorry. That's okay. Um, we are hearing from some sources who listen to it, and I don't know if they listen to, you know, what you guys did really focused right. on, on the words and got rid of some of that background, but maybe hearing the words rig here, meaning an ambulance or a squad or some terminology that, did you hear anything like that? <laughs> um, no, no, that's a fair question. Um, look, uh, <laughs> let, let me just tell you how this evolved for me personally, okay? When I listened to the original YouTube video, I didn't have the mindset, I gotta listen closely to see if there's any racial words. I, that wasn't my mindset at all. I listened to it, and then the second time the N-word I allege was used, to me it clearly can be heard. So then at that point, we played it, played it, played it, and it wasn't until multiple playings that we were able to get the first, uh, the first line, <coughs> which was, help me, Carr. Yeah, watch out for the end. Yeah, and it was at that point that I heard that too. And to be honest with you, the freaking end part, um, it wasn't until many, many uh, times listening to it that we then heard damn, D-A-M-N, the cuss word damn. Uh, so, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, we, we enhanced it. I feel confident that those are the words that are articulated. And if, if the department has a different position on it, great. If they want us to listen to other enhanced audio, fine. I don't know where this all, and again, I want to be clear, I don't know how relevant this is going to be at the end of the day for what happened that day. But I think it's important that this be presented and that people reach their own conclusions. I would ask the public, this uh, interview, by the way, will be posted on YouTube, so I would ask the public to listen. And I feel free, to, anybody can email me and give me your thoughts. Uh, I can tell you though, the contention on those words is my contention and that of my staff, okay? I don't want to pin that on Sheila and, and Walter, although I kind of know how they feel about it too. But I want to make clear that what we're saying publicly is this is the position of me and my staff, a total of six people. And that's how we feel about it. And it's going to take a lot to get us to change our mind, but you know, if someone wants to try, we'll certainly, uh, we'll certainly listen. So. 
Yeah. Sorry in the back, Don. Yeah, Don Allen is in the News Network. In regards to the Iowa Stafford video that you played, do you know if that was the same video that was sent to WCCO TV and the Star Tribune? CCO did do a story on the case, yes. Um, so I, I can't, I honestly can't remember, Don, if that was given to the Star Tribune. Although, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure the Star Tribune did do a story on Stafford. There, there was a lawsuit and there was a settlement. So, I mean, there were, there were some stories, but you. yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? Uh, sir, in the blue right here? Sure. Steve Brandt, Star Tribune. I wanted to ask because it arises from the media advisory that Mark Stafford had been supported out for events tomorrow by Brooks supporting Mr. Stafford. Um, they alleged that he was shot in the back of the head five times and in the back twice. You're talking about Mr. Mr. Sorry, Franklin? Mr. Franklin? Yeah, okay. Uh, do you have any information? Do you have any information on the I have not seen the autopsy. I don't think it exists yet. Um, we uh, believe in the complete integrity of the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office. And I can assure you that once we get that autopsy, I'm 99.9% .9 certain we will believe that's a valid piece of evidence. They're uh, excellent medical doctors over there. They do great work, and I, I'm confident it'll be valid. I can tell you that my parents did see, did see the body before it went to the funeral home. And they said that he was shot multiple times in the face and head. Is that right, Sheila? Okay. It was a face and head. Yeah. How many shots do you think it was in the head? Uh, Walter believes it was five shots in the in the head area, whether it's face or head. And uh, is, is it just a clarify, is the video we saw of the Stafford, I'm sorry, the audio across the street video we saw, was that enhanced or is that the unenhanced? That's the enhanced, yes. And Mr. I wonder if Mr. Chambers could tell your full name. <coughs> <coughs> Um, I have to correct something, Steve, sorry. Um, Walter just told me that the, that the shots to the head were all in the back of the head, not in the face. I apologize for my uh, mistake. That's right. How, how, how do you know? No where I know. Don't worry about that one. He looked at the body, sir. He looked at the body. It's my child. I know. That's all you need to know. Anybody else? Uh, sir, right back there. Yeah. Uh, John Lawrence of WCC TV. I just was wondering if Walter could comment on his thoughts about the audio, what he's hearing, and what he's seeing when you play that. He's not going to comment on the audio, sir, but thank you for the question. Sir? Okay, sir. Rob Wilson with Fox 9. If you're saying that he would not, you dispute him grabbing an officer's gun. Right. What do you allege has happened there? I, I don't know. We need to see the physical evidence. I think one possible scenario is rounds were shot and ricocheted rounds hit, hit officers. That's a possible scenario. Certainly the scenario that he grabbed a gun when the kid is not suicidal. I mean, think about that. If you grab, grab an officer's gun in the presence of, of other officers who are loaded for bear, including MP5, um, you know, SWAT type guns, I mean, you're asking to be killed. And that to me is a different version of suicide by cop. And uh, this kid wasn't suicidal, so why would he do that? Um, certainly character evidence in this kind of case is relevant, and I, I uh, can confidently tell you that friends and family, that none of them believe he was capable of something that stupid, frankly. So we'll just have to see. I mean, obviously the physical evidence helps. You know, like in the Fawn Lee case, we needed the physical evidence to come up with other scenarios. Dave? <coughs> For the uninitiated, what was he doing in the house? Uh, we believe the published reports are that he broke in to get away from the police. And folks, let me be clear about something. Uh, his attempt to evade the police is a crime. I get that. That's fine. But did that merit a death sentence? We don't know why he ran, and we'll never know because he's dead. Um, you know, there's all kinds of scenarios you can present, but certainly there isn't any indication that he had just committed some serious felony apparently there was an allegation he had committed a burglary at an earlier time but uh, we'll never know why he fled sometimes people flee for dumb reasons i mean i've had cases where people flee because they have a small amount of marijuana in their pocket that's a petty misdemeanor that's not even a crime but they'll flee he flee because he was scared yeah i think it's clear that this was a young man who was a scared rabbit he was just he was scared so the notion that someone scared would grab an officer's gun and start shooting, it, look, 
that is a scenario, if that's the ultimate conclusion of this department, which in my mind doesn't pass the smell test. That's me. Perhaps other people have different conclusions. The key is going to be, what is the physical evidence? For example, there's a claim that he attacked the dog, okay? Okay, is there any evidence of dog bites or any evidence of injuries from a dog on his body? We'll know from the autopsy, these kinds of things. So we'll just have to see. Anybody else? Dave? I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Dave, I'm going to go to the gentleman in the, okay. the green here. Edgar, CCO. we said radio again. Yeah. Uh, I just, just because this is the first time I'm hearing about this, and I just want clarification that, uh, so because when the body, when was the body turned over from the medical examiner? The, the, body was, the body was made available to the family for viewing, yes. And because of that viewing, that's and then, where... And then it went to the funeral home. So. And, and because of that, that's where you're saying that the, the wounds to Franklin's head was in the back? Is that correct? From seeing, from your witnesses? Yeah. The, okay. the, parents, the parents and other family members saw his body in the, in the morgue. Right. And that's where you say that the bullets were hit? That's what he says, yeah. Again, I, mean, I haven't seen the autopsy. This is just based on the, the, uh, the viewing of lay people. So, yeah. Dave? When you talk about enhancing the video and the audio, what processes are you talking about? Uh, I'd have to have my video expert address that. I'm not intelligent enough to address that. But basically, my lay understanding of what is done is background noise is taken out of the equation and makes it more audible. So. And is there any plan to do any other Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, we, trust me, we will do more. And is, is, it, is the word freaking that he uses, or is it the F word? I think it's freak. No, it's freaking. It's not frickin', it's freaking. F-R-E-A-K-I-N. That's how I spell freaking. It's damn freaking N. Somebody was really mad, apparently. So why would he use the N word, but refrain from the F word? I don't know. I guess you have to ask him. I don't think it's going to be real hard to identify who the officers are. I don't. I don't think it's going to be really hard to identify who the officers are. Do you know who the officers are? I have, sir. I have no clue. No clue. Ma'am. Do you know from from that uh, maybe timestamp if there is a timestamp on that video if that was at what point during the basement altercation? Do you know? I th I don't know, but I think it's reasonable to to conclude that the shooting had already happened because, I, like I told you, the, the way this begins is you have an officer run around the squad and he says. And I, I'm sorry, I wish I could remember it verbatim, but it's something like officer shot, officer down. And then that, uh, then another officer says bad, meaning how bad. And then you hear a third officer say, you know, where was he shot? So, so these are the perimeter officers, not Absolutely, yes. So I think that the shooting, all the shooting probably had happened and somebody had conveyed something on a shoulder mic, you know. But I mean, think about it. I mean, if you think about that, the way that scenario plays out, that to me, um, now, I, I don't know if they knew at that point that the kid was dead. You know, they knew that the sh an officer was shot. So the statement, watch out for the end, um, at that point, I would suggest they didn't know that the suspect was dead. But then the, the second comment is, I think, an officer venting because he's really mad that in his mind, he thinks an African-American suspect has shot one of his guys. So I think for that reason, I think, to me, it's logical. You know, it's logical. And, Oh, again, I, you know, I welcome the Minneapolis Police Department to give their version of what they think can be heard. You Have know. you um, given that enhanced audio to Chief Hartog? No, but I will. I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to give it to anyone. Okay. We haven't heard it. I'm sorry. We haven't heard anything from Sheila or, or we heard from Walter. Does Sheila want to say anything about no, say anything, Sheila. anything you presented today? No, not right now. Thanks for asking, though, sir. Sir? Has there been any suggestion by anybody that no, I don't think so. Uh, I, I'm, I'm reasonably certain that if, if he was armed, trust me, you'd know. <laughs> you would have known that within two hours. <laughs> uh, so I, I think it's reasonable to assume he was not armed. Um, and I think it's also reasonable to assume, again, we have a lot of work to do. I mean, obviously, I, w I was not retained until till recently, but I think that a real good source would be what the people in the bike shop uh, recall in that regard. And I think they'll probably say that there's no indication this young man was armed when he was in the bike shop before he ended up in the house and uh, was killed. So, Don? Yeah, uh, Mr. Pat, so, uh, Don Allen again. So there was not a fierce gun battle as reported by some of the television stations. 
Yeah, you know, it's hard for me to say. I mean, all I know is, you know, what, what the department has said is that two officers were shot. And, you know, the kid's dead. He's shot multiple times, and, and they're placing all the blame for this on the kid, the dead kid. So, I mean, you know, you know obviously, you know, like I said, the Minneapolis Police Department controls the investigation. That is frustrating, in a sense. We are not critical. I don't, I don't want this press conference, and I hope I haven't said anything critical of, of the chief. Um, you know, she, she has a really hard job. I understand that. I get that. Uh, but um, we're just going to have to see how it plays out. I mean, you got to understand, I'm a pretty cynical guy when it comes to this department. I'll tell you why. I was lead trial counsel on the Fong Lee case. In that case, in the beginning of that case, the Minneapolis Police Department told the public that that 19-year-old kid's fingerprint was on the gun that was found by his body. They said that. Two or three years later, when that case went to trial, we engaged in discovery. We found out, folks, that there was no trace evidence on the gun that was found near his body. Now, you don't have to remind me about the result of that case. I think about it every day, OK? But I would suggest to you that that was a case that took the veil off the department forever. And the way that this department handles civil rights cases, that line of demarcation has significantly changed from before the Fong Lee case to after. And I'm really mad about it, OK? That statement was never attributed to any one person. But you folks know, and I'm sure you were aware of that case, that he was shot eight times, which means there was significant blood spatter. There wasn't even a speck of blood on that gun, which would indicate that during the foot chase, the kid didn't have a gun. So they, they volleyed this grenade that the kid's fingerprint was on the gun, and that ended up being false. So I'm cynical about this department, <laughs> especially in cases invol involving high-profile deaths with people of color. I try not to let that affect my objectivity. But believe me, it's, uh, it's something that, that I, th I think about that case every day. So anybody else? Sir? Uh, some of us have talked to the fellow who shot the video that you're showing. And he says that when he was there, he was there, his ears were there. Um, and the N-word is one of those words that, you know, does kind of jump out at you if you hear someone say yeah. it, right? And yeah. he doesn't remember hearing that, so how do you, I, how does that, uh, that square with what you were saying on the video? That doesn't bother me at all. In real time, I think it's very easy to understand how that, he may not have heard that. In real time. I don't have any problem with that whatsoever, and I'm, I have no doubt he's telling the truth. But I think it's important to get the actual, the actual tape. And, uh, in fact, I'd be willing to work with the Minneapolis Police Department on that. That, that whoever the expert is to retain, <laughs> retain to address that issue, that, that, that be, I'll, I'll be happy to do that with the department, not unilaterally. But I think in real time, that really doesn't concern me. It does not concern me. Look, it's there. It's there. Listen, it's there. Anybody else? Sir? Uh, I'm Bill McGoy. Could you, the, could you announce your uh, media credential, please? I, I don't have a media. I can talk to you afterwards, oh, sir, but okay. not right now. No, no disrespect, sir. Where, where is that the video at? What's the title of it? Is it on YouTube right now? Yeah. What's it called? Do you know what it's called? Um, yeah, my client tells me there's two. One says Minneapolis shooting one, and one says Minneapolis shooting two. And I, and I, I think I'm going to say this because I think it's a matter of public record, and it's not a not a big issue. The name of the gentleman who recorded the video and then posted it on YouTube is uh, uh, Jimmy Gaines, G-A-I-N-E-S. And I say that because I believe that's a matter already for public consumption, so I don't think that's any great secret. Uh, but like I say, he's reached out to me, and I really appreciate that, and we'll certainly be getting a hold of him. So, Anybody else? We'll be available afterwards if anybody has any questions. Thank you for your time.